Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Joe Veers from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and on behalf of the church family, we extend our sentiments and our love to you as you go through this time of loss. It is a loss to the community itself, but today we celebrate Mary and what God has done inside of our life. And that, I think, calls for us to have lighter hearts, hearts which remember all the good things that Mary has done and what God has done through those moments as well. As a way of starting this moment, we're going to have some moments of remembrance, and I think these are the places where we oftentimes see the things that are also embedded in us, the reason that these days become special for us as well. Carla, where do you say? Carla? Carla's going to go first. was one of the major girls of Strasbourg, back when that probably meant something. The eldest child, she was sent to live with her grandparents in the house on Thomas Street, where her cousin lives now, because times were hard growing up, and Joe Mater wasn't always able to provide for his family. So Emma, Emmy Lou as we all knew her, worked as well to make sure her kids were fed, and Mary, Edna, Evelyn, and Eleanor were all raised with a strong work ethic she continues to carry down to each generation of their children. Mary worked hard. Long before I came along, she took care of her grandparents and many others. In my lifetime, she worked at the golf range, at the airport, as a mother, grandmother, and wife. Cooking, cleaning, and caring, hosting huge Thanksgiving dinners and family gatherings, always caring for everyone around her. She was active in her community with park clubs and her church. She kept in touch with family and friends despite distance. She made sure you knew what was going on with the rest of the family or friends so everyone felt included and part of something greater. She was part of the local community's history. During the flood of 55, she and Hal helped bring supplies and people in and out of the area with the airport. She is mentioned in a book about the flood as having loaned her car to a stranger to help the cleanup crew get organized. From others, I've heard stories of local dances where all the boys thought Mary was the prettiest and the best dancer there. <laughs> I have no doubt those stories are true. She was still the prettiest woman in Mrs. Bush's nursing home. <laughs> With stylish blouses and earrings, maybe even lipstick and a necklace for a special occasion, like Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesdays in my 20s were very special. Jolly Dolly Day. Around 9 a.m., Aunt Mary's car would be in Grand Mater's driveway. She had already picked up Nor, and my mom, Edna May, would wander over. When they were younger, <laughs> they went to Colonial Bowling Lanes and would bowl three games. Mary was famous for putting dents in the alleys with her walk and drop technique. <laughs> Occasionally it worked, and she usually averaged about 1.30 a game. As ladies got older, they replaced bowling with more board games before lunch. The Scrabble, Rummy Club, Rum Cub, Per Quacky, or Triominoes game was their way to stay sharp, gossip, and to work on or forget about problems for a while. Lunch at Motel in Town, B. Secker's Diner, Kitty's Tavern, or any other local restaurant was a social event, as Aunt Mary always ran into someone she knew. After lunch, they would visit Aunt Laura Griffin, Aunt Frances Mater, and their cousin Jean Halloway, or go to one of their own homes for a Haas and Pfeffer card game or Trivial Pursuit. This lasted until 4 o'clock sharp. Then it was time to go home and make dinner. I relished those days, full of laughter, family stories, and a little bit of competition. It was where I learned about living and loving family. Mary cherished every relationship she had with others. She especially enjoyed visitors. I would stop by on random evenings when she was alone, and the first thing she would start with was, guess who called me? Or guess who stopped in to see me? I'm sure you all heard it too about my visits. She reveled in our accomplishments and travels, and she cried with us at our losses. She read every word of every card every one ever sent her, aloud to anyone who would listen. She had to say happy birthday to each of us close to our birthdays if there was a cake nearby, and there was always a cake nearby. She made sure of it. I just spoke to her about a week ago about her spice cake recipe. It's still my favorite cake. And she knew the uh, magic ingredient, by the way, too. Those Mater girls, they were strong women. We continue on in their legacy, and who knows, maybe someday we'll be someone who makes a mark or simply holds a community together, like Mary, 
If so, it will be a better place. Aunt Mary had a strong Christian faith. I know she was resting now with her God, that family who has gone on before her. I find solace in thinking of her there. They always make it tough for the pastor when they do that. Miranda? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I gave some thought to what I would say about Aunt Mary, and I first off went kind of in the direction that Carla did, about remembrances and all of that. But then I thought, what, what thought comes to mind when I think about Aunt Mary? And the first thing is, she always had her hate. <laughs> always. So I thought, what happened with those hankies over the years? And I thought, Maybe the first hanky was to dry tears when she watched family and friends go off to World War II. And then maybe they were happy tears as those boys came home from the war and they got married. She and her sisters got married, had babies, and maybe more happy tears when the babies came. And she, certainly drying children's tears as those babies grew that next generation. Um, <clears throat> Then it was her children and her sister's children getting married. There were tears at those weddings as we all got together and had tears of joy. And then after those weddings, more births uh, and tears of joy. But she lived long enough to use this hanky for, for tears of sadness as she watched her three sisters and her three brother-in-laws pass and then of course, her husband of 61 years at the age of 100. Um, and that when I saw her remain teary and using that hanky longer, um, as you would suspect. But <clears throat> once she left the airport, I know that was a sad time for her. And more tears. But she settled in at Mrs. Bush's. And I would agree with Carla. She probably was the prettiest resident there. Um, and she always cared about how she looked, and um, I think there'd be no quarrel about who was the cutest woman at Mrs. Bush's. It got a little more difficult to visit with COVID, of course, and I came up one time, and Joanne and I sat at the other end of a six-foot table uh, with plexiglass and all of that, but we got to visit. It was a little chilly outside there, <laughs> but we got our visit, and the last time we visited, was just a couple of weeks ago when we got our, and I don't know if George or Joanna who came up with the idea, but it was wonderful. We could park ourselves in a folding, folding lawn chair outside her window and she'd be in her rocking chair and we'd talk on the phone. And the very last time I saw this hanky of hers come out, we were, I don't know if you recall, we were sitting there and she started to rich around, I guess you can say that in this rich, uh, Rich around in her uh, in her rocking chair, and Joanne said, "Mom, what are you doing? What are you looking for?" She said, "I can't find my hanky." <laughs> well, she found it, and and I need I need one today. I miss her desperately, but I I couldn't I couldn't ask for any richer a life because of her. Brenda, thank you so much. Do you mind if I take my mask off? Brenda, thank you so much. Carla, thank you. Now, <laughs> you already said this. <laughs> this paragraph's going. We're going to muddle through this. Can you hear me in the back?
my mother, Mimi, wanted me to read a little something I wrote in college. There's no way I'm going to get through this. <laughs> I say, oh, no. I took a speech class and a communication class. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly what the assignment was. But here's a piece I wrote, and it's entitled Family Communications. Now remember, this was 40 some odd years ago. So let's go back in time. <laughs> to understand communications in my family, you must first realize the problems we must overcome. Just to pass a simple statement of fact was a chore. <laughs> first of all, my mother was slightly dense. It's not that she was stupid. Her mind just operates on a different wavelength than everybody else's. For instance, she doesn't think no is an acceptable answer for certain questions. Many times she had asked me, do you want anything to eat? After which I looked her straight in the eyes, shook my head from left to right, and replied, very straightforward, no thank you. She would then come out with, how about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of milk? No mother, I'm still not hungry. Without comprehension, she would continue. How about some leftover meatloaf or a grilled cheese sandwich? <laughs> and as I turn to leave the room, she can still be heard. Or I can heat up some leftover spaghetti and make you some French toast. <laughs> Another major problem is my father was slightly hard of hearing. Anything said in a normal tone of voice is either misunderstood or must be repeated. This tends to draw out a conversation to the extent where the point is often missed. <laughs> a sample conversation would be me. What's the, what's the weather like for tomorrow? Dad. Okay, where do you want to go? <laughs> I said, what's the weather like? Oh, I thought you said let's take a hike. <laughs> well, don't swear at me. I said, well, oh, well what? <laughs> you still haven't answered my question. How about over the mountain? <laughs> no, that's your question. I want to know about the weather. By this time, I could pretty much just look out the window and see what the weather was going to be tomorrow. In addition to my mother being in her own train of thought and my father being hard of hearing, there's usually enough commotion in our household to keep everyone confused. I have two older sisters with three children between them, and they all like to come and visit. Historically, the kids have a running contest to see who can make the most noise and get the most attention. My sisters have no personal inadequacies, but just adding to the number of people in the room decreases the possible upper limit for an intelligent conversation. <laughs> this is a well-documented phenomenon, first observed in the Congress of our United States. All these factors combine to make any attempt at holding a conversation somewhat exasperating and quite amusing. <laughs> past week has been filled with memories and emotions. Pictures in my mind of my mother, little snippets of time, sometimes like a photograph, sometimes like a short video in my head, <clears throat> with sound or maybe silent, usually in color, but not necessarily. And after trying to organize my thoughts and categorize the memories, it occurred to me that most memories were not of Mimi alone. Most were with my father, Papa, or with family, or friends. But people, there were always people. I'd like to share a few of those memories some from personal experience, 
some from stories told. Mimi was born in 1924 and grew up in the Depression years. They were poor, but everybody was poor. If you were lucky, there was food on the table. Mary had three sisters, the major girls as they were known. Mimi was the oldest of the four sisters, and as the oldest, she was asked, and I know that's not the right word, but I don't know what the right word is, but she was asked to go live with her grandparents on Thomas Street. Her grandfather worked for the railroad, so he had a good job, which was rare in those times. But it took him away from home, and her grandmother didn't like to be alone. So Mary went to stay with him. Picture Cinderella without the glass slippers. The house on Thomas Street is still in the family, and there's a room in the back that still to this day called Mary's room. In her high school years, Mimi developed a love of dance. Apparently she was quite good at it. She performed locally and in dance competitions as far away from what I've been told as Atlantic City. <laughs> Soon after high school, while working at Wyckoff's department store, a customer came in. And Mr. Wyckoff himself said to Mary, Mary, take care of this gentleman. This is Mr. Hamlin. Apparently, Mary took her work very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> she spent the next 60 years of her life taking care of Mr. Hamlin. They had two daughters and built a business, Hamlin's Lion Service. And then a son. One of my earliest memories, one of those little snippets, is me sitting on a bicycle, probably four or five years old, by the airport pavilion. Faceless people all around, but there were people. And Mimi, with her clipboard and her booming voice, calling out the next four names on her list to go take an air tour. They made a great team, my parents, running the airport. They worked long hours, 364 days a year. Dad flew the planes and did the bookkeeping. Mom was in charge on the ground. I know no one's surprised about that. <laughs> <laughs> In her later years, still living adjacent to the airport, I would often ask her what kind of plane was coming in or taking off. And for the most part, she knew. That's a beach track, beach craft. That's a Bonanza. Cessna 172 or a Navion. Then I would ask her what kind of car was coming down the road. <laughs> and she would say, red. Or blue. <laughs> After the airport was sold in 1967, Mimi was in her mid-40s and too young to retire. So she worked the Christmas season at Hallmark Cards in the Stroud Mall. And in summer, she worked at Mount Manor in the shack at the Red Course. As I'm sure you all know, the Red Course was a beginner's course, a part three executive course. That's where the golf bug bit dead. So they opened the golf driving range. And Dad put Mom to work for the next 30 years. <laughs> she sold balls, she drove the ball picker, but mostly what she did was visit. Anyone who came by was welcome to sit a spell. But that's just a glimpse of Mary's work life, her professional biography and work history. What I remember most is not a specific event, but a lifetime of observation which has commingled to form impressions that have become memories. For example, I have a vision of Mimi in a rocking chair in her living room, rocking a baby to sleep. 
gently patting the baby's bottom. <laughs> it's not a specific baby because the vision is a collective memory of many grandchildren. And I'm sure it started long before I was there. If you shared that vision with me, then you know when I said Mimi was gently patting the baby's bottom, that was a lie. <laughs> it was more of a rhythmic thumping. <laughs> but she had the touch. And she loved babies. Now babies tend to grow up. And as they grow, the rocking and thumping stage would wane and snack time would begin. <laughs> What toddler can resist a cookie, or a cracker, or jello, or ice cream? Mimi knew how to win a toddler's affection. And then, at four, five, or six, board games were introduced. <laughs> who in this room, who in this room, learned how to count playing sorry? <laughs> Who remembers that if you draw a four, you have to go backwards? <laughs> Who remembers that if you draw an 11, you can exchange places? But if you watched her play as an adult with a child, you'd soon realize it didn't matter if the child could count exactly right, or if he sent her home by sliding on his own collar. Mimi was teaching a bigger lesson. How to enjoy the game, no matter who won. How to have fun spending time together. Now, by the time you were seven or eight, different story. <laughs> Things were a little more competitive, and you better know how to count. <laughs> the lessons were different. Like you have to play by the rules. Don't be a sore loser. But having fun, spending time together, that never changed. No matter how old. Board games were played at the kitchen table. Cards were played at the table. Horse and pepper, canasta, peanut butter. And if a new person came in that didn't play cards, there was the penny card game Michigan Rum. <laughs> Mimi was all about making a new arrival feel included and comfortable. Life centered around the kitchen table. There were roast beef dinners every Sunday after church, holiday meals, Turkey with all the fixings, hours upon hours playing cards, solving a problem, or discussing issues of the day, or reminiscing with an old friend. And there was one unspoken rule, you had to eat something, <laughs> usually cake. There was always either a raisin spice cake a molasses cake, or a chocolate cake, always at the ready. And if for some reason the cake was gone, there was a box of tasty cakes in the cupboard. <laughs> and coffee. Always coffee. Maybe tea, but only if you said no to the coffee. Mimi's life centered around family. She set a great example for all of us about how to make people around here feel safe and comfortable. As I said before, most of the memories I have are Mimi, are with other people around. Always family and laughter. More recently, over the past few years, I had a chance to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with Mimi. It's time I will cherish. At her home by the airport, sitting on the patio, watching skydivers come down, or having a glass of iced tea at the kitchen table. 
There were no earth-shattering revelations or deep conversations about the meaning of life. Just a mother and son. I can hear to it together. <laughs> Just a mother and son spending a little time together. And then as Mimi became a little more unsteady on her feet and a little more afraid to live alone, it was time to sell her home and move to Mrs. Bush's assisted living. Mimi, being Mimi, was soon the unofficial peer counselor and social director at Mrs. Bush's. <laughs> Other residents would come to her room to play cards or complain about the food. Nobody could hear or remember what suit was Trump, but they were all happier in Mimi's room. I got to visit with her at least once, usually twice a week. Rummy Cup was our game. She was pretty good at it, but she was getting older and more tired. She used to say they were making the hallway longer, <laughs> or she would say, I think your mother's getting old. And then COVID appeared. Now before I tell you this final little story, my sister Donna and I want to publicly thank our sister Joanne amazing job she did taking care of me these past 15 years. Countless doctor appointments, car rides for lunches, the paperwork and the bills being paid, hosting holiday dinners and summer picnics, trimming the grass at her house, the home repairs that you were never afraid to jump into with both feet. <laughs> the weekly food shopping, and the Christmas shopping. All to keep Mimi going and in good spirits. Thank you. I'll see you in the fall when the work's all done. See you in the fall when the work's all done. It's a phrase Mimi adopted this past summer. It's how she would sign off of our phone calls. When the coronavirus pandemic took hold in March, no one knew how long it would last. To their credit, Mrs. Bush was, was very quick to shut the place down. And as far as we know, the virus did not get in. At first, outside visitors were banned, but life on the inside was relatively normal. But very soon, the residents, including Mimi, were confined to their rooms. There was no more car teams, no more meals in the dining room, no hair appointments, no extracurricular activities, and Mimi felt isolated. Every phone call she would ask, when will this be over? When can I get out of here? No one knew. There was no answer. Watching the news in the outside world, it became apparent that the lockdown could last a long time. Mary didn't watch the news. We couldn't tell her she'd be stuck in there probably until the following year. As the weeks turned into months, sometime during the summer, the other, at the end of every phone call was, when do you think I will see you again? And I would answer with something like, looks like it might be a while, to which she would pronounce, I guess I'll see you in the fall when the work's all done. 
which eventually was shortened to, I'll see you in the fall when the work's all done. <laughs> Mimi could have written the script for how her story would end. If she could have written it, it would have played out exactly as it happened. She lived a good long life, but she was getting tired. She never wanted to be a burden or suffer a debilitating illness. She was mentally sharp with her quick wit intact right up to the last days. And then, in an instant, it changed. She was still with us, but just long enough for us to come to terms with what was happening and to visit with her a little while longer. And then, peacefully, with grace and dignity, she was gone. Mimi left the legacy of how to live life. She showed us what is important, how to make a stranger feel like a friend, how to make a friend feel like family, how to make family feel loved. I'll see you in the fall when the work's all done. It's fall. Your work's done. Good job, baby. Thanks. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It's a change to side. Thank you. Days like today are about the joys and about the grief and about celebrating what God has done. We start by doing that. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the theme of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Mary, and we thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so that we may see in death the gate to eternal life. So we may continue our course on earth in confidence until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to do the, Lord, the um, 23rd Psalm, and had anticipated that we would have it on the little handout uh, remembrance that was done at the front, but I understand it's not there, so I'll say the 23rd Psalm, and if you have the memory to come along with me, you're welcome to do that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup covered over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have a very special moment here. Katie is going to be singing for us a very special song, Let There Be Peace on Earth, which I think that the family appreciates.
You guys are really tough to follow. <laughs> the gospel that I've chosen for today may seem like an odd passage, but stick with me on this one. It's from Luke, the 14th chapter. Here what Luke writes. On one occasion when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? They could not reply to this. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit in the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host, and the host who invited you both may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then in disgrace, you would start to the lowest place. And when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Here ends the Gospel lesson. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we the Christ. Amen. Now, of all the things we do, the stuff that we do every day, therefore probably don't think much about it, what we eat tends to be something that's not important, but it is probably one of the most influential things that we do. I say this for two reasons. The self-evident reason, that is, you know, if we don't eat, we don't live. We need it for our bodies, we need it for our minds. But there's a second aspect to it, too, which I think we give less credence to. There's the community aspect. There's the spiritual aspect of what takes place when we meet with other people. The community building that takes place is part of it as well. And as you know well, Memories are from forged around the dining room table, a place where food and drink for one moment become something that is not just a memory, it's a taste, like a roast beef meal. It's something that sticks with you because it's more than just a meal. And the expected, the usual, can many times become the most treasured for us as we look back over things which we now have the perspective to understand. What may even be better, though, is going on for lunch. Because you don't have to do the dishes if you do that. And I have to admit that that really has appealed to me as well. But if you think about it for a second, when you look at our eating habits, they become both formative, but also informative about our identity. You learn something about a person when you watch what they do at a meal table. And saying that, I'm conscious to my own preference for the last choice. I prefer going out for a meal because I don't have to do the dishes. I'm not a particular fan of doing dishes, by the way. But it's also these moments now, as we're drawing close to the holidays, I'm conscious of how this loss will influence us, especially going towards Thanksgiving. You know, the memories of the things that you have when you come to those meals, all the special things that you have because, like Thanksgiving, the simplicity. It's just a meal being eaten with your family. It doesn't have the other doodads that come along with a lot of the other different celebrations that we do. And turkey, of course, is a favorite, and it's better to bake a turkey rather than broil one, just in case you needed to have that knowledge. <laughs> but then again, it's not always about the food. It's, it's about us gathering together to be able to appreciate that, the company and the memories that we form as well, but even more so to celebrate this very special lady that we call Mary, or mom, or grandmother. Even there, we miss the reality that, of course, is more than food, and I think this has been picked up by everybody. They bring to Carla and George, who all have done this very well. It's about our people that we get to know. And that comes with Mary, and Joanna talked to me about this, and I had this image whenever she spoke about it that just I couldn't get out of my head, her gassing the airplane out there <laughs> and flipping the prop to kick it over. But what the image was was more about the people standing there waiting for that moment some young married couple that was waiting 
for this tour to see the grandeur of God over the Poconos. And this couple who had taken this moment to touch into that beginning portion of who they were. Have you ever thought about how important that was? Have you ever thought about the smallness of what it is, but how many people they would have met as a consequence? So clearly in the hundreds is way too small. It's probably in the tens of thousands. And if you start to think about it, you start forgetting about the fact that it's in these small moments that the critical portion of what takes place becomes revealed. And in that, we see something where God's grandeur touches, but it's also the simplest of moments. And I think this passage in the Gospel picks this up for us today as well. Lives being changed by seemingly inconsequential events, a happenstance along the road going towards a meal. You can almost envision this for a second. This man with dropsy who's down the road and Jesus is there at that moment. And it's not without reason that Jesus is going to say, using the image of a well, in order to explain his choices here, because this man is literally drowning in his own fluid. He's retaining that fluid where his organs are becoming saturated. He's dying as a consequence of it. And curing this man would seem to be the highlight of what's going on. But I think it's bigger than that. It's bigger than just this moment where he cures a man. It's about the question of our relationships as well. He challenges the Pharisees, asking them the question whether or not the strictures of the Sabbath are overcome by God's grace and God's choice to change the relationship to this human, and more so, not just this human, to humanity itself. You know, we see it's singular, but it's a bigger issue than that taking place. Could this fellow have waited just one more day and then you wouldn't have to worry about the Sabbath? Maybe. Or maybe Jesus knew this was the critical moment. There's more than one death involved in what's taking place if he doesn't act. And the choice here is something bigger than the healing itself. It's about life itself. It affirms, first of all, that God is not indifferent to the death of this person. He's not indifferent to our death either. There we understand that this God of abundance is the one that also feeds us every day. Moments of life because of something that we don't even pay attention to. It's confirmation that God provides not just for the sick, but for the poor and the hungry. Where human kindness can never be a measure of what's being repaid. He's assuring us, I think, inside of this passage that this intimate tie between our table fellowship, what we do at the meal, and what God does in our very mortality. That in both of these events, God becomes present. So can we see it in the one that seems more invisible? Yet, if we get God's power of healing, that's the easy part in this passage. I mean, there you see God's offering. God's doing something special. But Jesus then eats with these people just like he does so often. And then he suffers the cross, tying that issue of mortality to the opportunity and the gift being offered in life. It's done linking this meal to a God of life, a God of healing, a God that gives rebirth. We might miss today, it's really not about Mary's death, because if we do that, we've just shunted God away for the moment. Uh -uh -uh. Conscious of the fact because I grieve the loss of Mary. I didn't know Mary very long, but Mary is just one of those people that's easy to be able to get to know. And it, I think today, if we only see it in terms of the loss, what we fail to grasp is we're encountering the very moment of life. God becomes present in this moment on our road. A road where death seems the more evident portion. Like this man with dropsy, that's the evident portion. And if we focus on that, then we forget that God is in this moment with a promise also that he cures the sick and gives us food at all times and refuses to do anything other than to offer us life. What we see as lifeless, God sees as the seed in which resurrection takes form. And like the man with dropsy, I think this is the important question. Will we stand on the road silently while God exercises power right in front of our eyes and miss it? That's the question. Will we see God's power in this moment?
Now Mary loved board games. We've heard about that card game she loved to do. Playing with her grandchildren, bowling. And we know that yellow roses are the best colored roses, right? right. Everybody knows that. Right. And when family gets together at Christmas time, that is the better gift than anything that's wrapped under the tree. In the vast experience of her some 95 years of living, she was comfortable with the fact that God was present in her life. She talked to me about it. In my visits at Mrs. Bush's personal care facility, we talked about the little things. Stuff outside the window. One of the residents, what they ate. She talked about you. She talked about the family, about her children and her grandchildren to the third power. <laughs> she talked about you, and you could see her glow. I remember the hanky, never paid attention to it. But the hanky was always present, too, for us as well. And sometimes we would talk theology yeah. over some simple thing, what God was doing that moment. I think she's among the most wonderful women that I've had a chance to be blessed with in the course of my life. And I don't say that about many people. I'm lucky to have had many people in my life that have altered who I am and what I am as a person. And I don't doubt, in fact, you guys proved this multiple times today, that what you know here in your testimonials are far more important than anything that I can possibly say today. But I would say this. God built a relationship between the two of us. And in the vast ocean of our humanity, where Mary seems just like one small droplet, that is a mistake to believe. She showed God's power of living in the way she conducted herself. In her humble doing, just in gassing up the plane, flipping the plot, getting a cup of coffee, making a sandwich, all of those little things. So mundane, God exalted every one of those moments because he built a relationship to who she touched. And it's not in the tremendous things, but in the very small moments where God offers and reveals and feels into something we call resurrection. And when we awake each day, and I don't think people often talk about this, you know you're never going to be the same person you were when you wake up tomorrow morning. You can't be. You're a new person. You're actually born every day when you wake up. All the sins that you had before are gone away. You go through little events of resurrection all the time, and we miss them as we gather and look at ourselves. And gold ultimately takes those moments and exalts them in a different way. See, we take the lowest place at the table, what's called the grave, and God brings us up to the very highest seat in a place called resurrection. And the roast beef is really good. <laughs> and the hankies are always there, and you never have to do the dishes. Let's pray. God, the generations rise and pass before you. You are the strength of those who labor. You are the rest for those of the blessed dead. We rejoice in the company of your saints. Remember all who have lived in the faith, all who have peacefully died, especially those most dear to us, Mary, who now rest in your care. Give us in time our portion with those who have trusted in you and have striven to do your holy will. In your name, with the church on earth and the church in heaven, we ascribe all glory and honor both now and forever. Amen. Katie is going to give us the blessing of the Lord's Prayer. Here.
Conclude the service here at the funeral home. We are going over to Prospect Cemetery for the graveside service. If you're going with us in the procession, we just ask you to please turn your headlights and flashers when we're ready to leave here. At this time, if you'd like to pay your last respects to the casket, you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, we just ask you to go right up to your car so we can get ready to go. And as you do leave, those who are going to serve as pallbearers and help carry the casket, if you just wait out in the hallway by the side door, there will give you further instructions. Thank you. Thank you. 